Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to our service of worship, Freedom Fellowship Church in Tiny Town, Arkansas, and we're glad you're able to join us this morning. We're still happen, having to operate via YouTube because of all the things that are going on in our world right now, and we are going to adhere to the, uh, what the officials want us to do as far as not gathering in great numbers. But it's just a result of what is going on all around us right now, and it, it's affecting everybody in every walk of life. And one of the things that, co- that we're all dealing with right now is a certain level of stress. And the stress we're experiencing causes a lot of angst. And this morning as we get into God's Word, I, what I like to do is for us to reflect on what really matters. And I also want to bring you this. Here's a stimulus package from God. And we, we're getting a stimulus package from Congress, but here this morning we're going to look at the stimulus package from God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, Paul said this, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. And we think about where we were as Christians before we were Christians and now where we are as Christians, and we look at this verse and we see we once were dead. We once, once were in chains. We once were slaves to sin. But in verse Before he says, but God, so rich in mercy, because he loved us. In in that key part of beginning of verse 4, but God. God sent his son that we wouldn't have to deal with the perils of eternal death. He also gave us his son to help us deal with everyday life. And I think at times we get away from thinking that God, God can help me now that Jesus is a part of my life right now and we get caught up into the world again. We get caught up into the struggle more than the answers. So why is it when we get into a period of struggle that we we tend to revert back to the way that we used to do things, the way that we did before we put on Christ? And does that cause me to just accept what goes on all around me and become a part of the flow that just drift with the world and those are questions we ask ourselves and you said what about the stimulus package well the stimulus package paul is talking about in ephesians is to remember what god has done for us and what he's going to do and no matter what is going on out there i can remember the two words of verse four but god but god so rich in mercy and love me so much that he gave his son. He's not going to give up on me, and I don't need to give up on him. So as Christians, we all struggle a lot with what is going on, and particularly right now, here we are at a time in which we all are in confines of home. Most of us can't get out as much as we have. We're, people aren't working. They're not able to leave the home. But one of the things that is happening is a time to slow down. And during this time to slow down, we need to reevaluate and see where am I with my relationship with God? Where am I with the relationship I have with my family? And our main text today is going to be Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. And in this passage, we are going to see God's plan for us to change. If we're caught up in the world, he wants us to change. And change is not easy for us. But this other thing that we remember is that in Revelation chapter 12, we see that the enemy, that is Satan, the enemy never changes. He's always about attacking. He's always about deceiving. He's always about accusing the brethren. So as this passage of Ephesians 4 talks to Christians, it's very relevant to us today what is going on. We're being discouraged by the enemy. We're being told by the enemy we're going to collapse financially. We're going to collapse in every way possible around us. But God is saying, wait a minute. Trust in me. Trust in me. I have the stimulus package that you need. So as we, Paul talks about change, 
we need to remember the change is possible. Here's a, a quote that I came across that I'd like to share with you. And it, it reflects maybe where many of us are right now. Only dead fish float downstream, but live fish swim against the current. Only dead fish float downstream. Are you caught up into the agonies of life? And we say, what is the use? And we're in the panic mode and we just float down the stream like a dead fish. Are we living for God or are we just going with the flow? And that's what this quote is talking about right here. People that are living for Christ are swimming against the current flow of life. They're swimming for Christ and not just floating and accepting what's going on in the world. Again, but God so rich in mercy. And in verse 5 of chapter 2, he said that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And it's only by God's grace that you have been saved. We have something to be happy about because we're, we're saved. We're made alive and we don't have to go with the flow. Now, God has given us the ability to change, but it's, it's difficult because the human part of us is always pulling against the spiritual side. But Paul tells us in Galatians 5, the way we make the change, he says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. It all goes back to turning our life over to God and letting the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us and he'll produce the fruit in our lives so let's go to chapter 4 and get into the text as he's talking to us about why the change part's important so verse 17 of chapter 4 of Ephesians so say so this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the fertility of their mind being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. What Paul is saying here, stop believing the enemy's lies and stop floating downstream. See, Paul gives us six descriptions of the old life and said why is that so important again he's talking to christians he's talking to people who are struggling in life and here are these six descriptions the first being futility he says stop living here he said like the gentiles what he was referencing to stop being worldly stop living like you used to stop behaving like you did before coming to christ he said that's futile and our outlook on our current situation here in our country is that either we see hope or we see doom. Don't be futile in looking at things as being in, in the doom category. They've got to be in the positive. The second description he gives us is darkness in verse 18. He said, being darkened in their understanding... When we live in the dark in our minds, we become confused. And then our thoughts turn away from God and go to a negative sense. It, it, it really embraces what Satan wants us to embrace. Satan doesn't attack Christians the same way he attacks somebody he already has. Sta Satan works on where we're vulnerable. And right now, many of us are struggling with our attitudes because we don't see the, the end of all this. There will be an end to it because God is in control. God has all this in his hands. So Jesus called us to be children of light, to be the opposite of darkness. So it brings us to the third point, and that's hardness in verse 18. He said, because of the hardness of the heart. When we go back into the world that we came out of, a hardness develops. When someone knows Christ and has lived for Christ and abandons that life and goes back to the world, they're even harder than they were when they were in the world in the first place when they come back. And Paul is talking about this because it creates such a 
a division within a soul. See, what happens when somebody has this hardness of heart, they have a lack of concern what God thinks and what God wants, and they lose interest in doing things God's way. Refusing to follow the Holy Spirit's lead, and, and they close their mind to what God is having to say through His Scripture, and you're certainly not listening to the Spirit's lead. And that results in becoming, in verse 19, callous becoming more self-absorbed not concerned about the need of others difficult times either pushes closer to god when we allow it to or pushes further away but it's all how we embrace our relationship with god god is the same today and forever and for eternity he'll always be here for us and then Paul says in verse 19 that after coming callous, they give themselves over to sensuality, just simply living for, for the pleasures of life. It could be for lust. It could be for things that people want beyond their relationship with God. But we tend to think about sensuality referring to a sexual sin. But here we are at this time in our country in which though that might not be something that hits me personally or hits you personally but yet paul says in verse 19 the last of these is greed and that's just simply meaning i'm going to please myself over the needs of others so these six descriptions gets down to the point of saying is have i become a user of other people to benefit what I want? Have I, or have I become someone that is floating downstream like the dead fish? Am I the one that has lost a relationship with my God? So Paul's response to these things are in verse 20 of Ephesians 4, and he says, but that isn't what you learned about Christ. The things that he mentioned in verses 18 and 19, he's saying these are not the things. This is not how you learn Christ. So we go back to first things first. For God so loved me that he gave his only son so that I could live for eternity. Again, going back to Ephesians 2 and verses 4 and 5. But God so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even when we were dead because of our sin, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace you've been saved, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. The relationship that we have in Christ is because we're united with him. We're united with him for eternity, and that is the positive thing that we've got to carry on in our thoughts in our presence of mind as we're dealing with all what's going around us at this time he said this is the reason for your existence you're a, you're united with christ so here in verse 21 paul comes to the point he says since you have heard about jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him since we know what the truth is do we still believe the truth do you believe the truth that you once learned do you count on it do you think of yourself as believing the absolute truth of jesus without us saying oh wait a minute i have this issue wait a minute i have that issue what he's telling us it doesn't matter the issue the problems of life are temporary the problems of life we overcome with truth. So we need to test ourselves. In 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, Paul was saying this to the church at Corinth. Examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. Jesus doesn't abandon us. We abandon him. 
And we need to test ourselves and face facts. Have I pulled, pulled away from Jesus? Am I, do I truly believe the truth? Do I truly believe that he's going to be with me no matter what? Do I truly believe that God has me in the, his, his hands? See, that's, that's what people have struggled with for thousands of years. People in Corinth, people in Ephesus were dealing with these same issues that Paul was addressing. It's not new. But what it, we need to do is examine ourselves and see if our faith is genuine, as you said in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. So we've got to have a conviction. We've got to have a conviction about the sin in our life. And as we're reflecting, we have more time to reflect and not call up in the hustle bustle of work and as much and the kids going to school and we're there with our children more and our grandchildren more. It's time to reflect and to say, what is really important? And do I have a deliberate lifestyle that includes Jesus Christ? See, these are the changes that Paul said need to happen. And then verse 22 through 24 of chapter 4, Paul has given us the three changes that have to be made. So look at verse 22 of chapter 4. He says, change number one, put off the old self. Throw off your old sinful nature in your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. He's saying, stop the things you used to do. Just stop it. And he says, put to death the things that are lurking within me that cause me to drift from God, whatever those may be. Put it to death. Put your sinful desires to death. Change 2, verse 23. Change what you put into your mind. He says in verse 23, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. What we put in our mind is deliberate. And Paul is telling us, be deliberate letting the Holy Spirit put those things in your mind. We need to be in the Word. We need to be in our Bibles. We need to be in prayer. We need to be watching things that bring me closer to God. It could be sermons on YouTube. It could be uh, reading reading commentaries could be on books of help me get closer to the Lord, but it's deliberate what we put in our mind. So we download masses, massive amounts of information daily into our mind. And we choose the larger portion of that that we put into our mind. We're exposed to a lot of things out here, but we choose the majority of what we're going to receive into our mind. Do I spend more time watching Netflix or television than I do studying God's Word. See, things that affect me go into my mind. We choose to be renewed or not. So Paul is saying, change what you put in your mind. Be renewed by the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. So be proactive. Paul said in Romans chapter 2, 12 and verse 2 don't copy the behavior and customs of the world don't copy those behaviors that the world sets out there we want to follow the the example that christ set we want to stop floating downstream and we want to be transformed by the holy spirit then when the spirit's in charge and i'll think differently i'll have peace i'll have joy and I'll have the power of God working within my life. And the last change he talks about is in verse 24. Change number three, do what God has called you to do. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Paul is saying here, put on the new nature. He told us that we were a new creation created through Christ put on that new nature put on the nature of God and in Galatians 5 the fruit of the spirit is what's going to happen in our lives when we put on this new nature Paul said this in Colossians 3 and verse 2 
Think about the things of heaven and not the things of earth. So what does pursuing God look like? I'll go back to Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23. But let the Holy Spirit produce this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is what happens in our life when the Holy Spirit is leading, when the Holy Spirit is in charge. See, the struggle is too great for us to try to balance one foot in the world and one in God in the spiritual world of God is too great. It says, oh, say, stop living in the world system. And again, only dead fish float downstream, but live fish swim against the current. See, uh, it's time that we allow God to love us and embrace it. Embrace God. Embrace the love that he gives us through Jesus Christ. And during this time of crisis, we see the glass half full and not half empty. So we know God's in charge and he reigns supremely and he's going to bring us through this. Yes, there are difficulties and there's, there are times in which are very tough on folks, but it's not time to panic. It's time to embrace Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for how much you love us, how much that you choose to love us and embrace us. Help us, Father, make the changes necessary in our lives as we reflect. Make the changes that Paul, your servant, was talking about in Ephesians 4 in our lives to bring us closer to you. Let us feel your presence in our lives through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Eric, thanks. Uh, I would mention to you as you watch this, what a great amount of information as he delivered the, the message that's the stimul stimulus package from God. I'd encourage you to, to, to watch this again. Get your notepad out. Have your Bible ready. But watch this again. There's a tremendous amount of information packed in those, those few verses that he, uh, that he gave us today. I, uh, I listened to something on the radio this week. It was uh, called stamps.com. So just kind of follow this, uh, this process. So what they were talking about, if you have a computer at your house and if you have a printer, then what you can do is you can download your postage. Then once you've downloaded your postage, then you can print it, put it on the letter, walk it out to your mailbox, put it in the mailbox, and then the postman at some point picks that up. The point they were making and really the sales advantage that they were talking about was this, that to do this, you need no human contact. Well, see, uh, even though we're under the guidelines and we're minimizing our hu human contact, which is, which is good, I thought about the importance of contact with others, that human contact. See, our contact may be different today, but it's still critical. We still need contact with others, other people. People still have needs. They still have worries. Their life is still going on, even though maybe it's, they're shuttered in, in, a, in a particular place. But they still have needs. We still have the needy. I was heartened by the fact that our mission team this week was preparing packages to go to the homeless. You know, they didn't shut down. They're still doing those kind of things because needs still exist. And I was thinking about, too, about the amount of anxiety that is created. It's high right now. And I thought, what better time for the gospel message, the hope of Christ? What better time is there for that than, than this time that we have today? I just thought to myself that not only do other people need to hear that, but, man, I need to drink it in, too, because we all face different fears about change or illness or loved ones, whatever those things are. And then I went on to think that, that even though that calmness comes with the gospel message, I'm so glad that God didn't make the choice that he was going to have no human contact, that he did send his son Jesus for us. He gave us a path to Christ. He gave us a path to Christ that basically is this. You believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth and you will be saved. And those are the things that we understand. 
I want to just, uh, again, uh, just highlight the fact that we have people that, that we're praying for this week. Um, Bill McClure, Paul Young, Lisa Voigt, Dennis Stablemont, Isabel Smith. They're people that are engaged in a, in a fight with cancer today. Uh, Janice Williams uh, is recovering from a car wreck but hopes to go back to work this week. Melissa Humphrey still fighting things that have to do with... Uh, the uh, uh, nature of uh, the heart issues that she faces. So the many of us that are anxious, that's another thing we should be praying about. So keep these things on your prayer list this week. We'll meet you back here again for our midweek service on Wednesday. And again, I just pray, Lord, as we, we close today, let me pray with you as we close our service today. Father, I just pray that you will dampen our fears. Some of those things are healthy. They, they, they are respectful. But, Lord, I, I ask you to help us keep those things within healthy bounds. I ask you, Lord, too, to help us focus on the fact that, uh, that these are times that, that God, that, that great good can come from them. And help us search out the great good that can come from these times in relationships and support and praying with each other and reconnecting whatever those things are. But, Father, we love you. We thank you for, that you would love us enough that you didn't li limit personal contact, but you sent your son Jesus for us. In Jesus' name, amen.